Henry Varley was born October 25th in 1835. He grew up in a little town called Tattershall, Lincolnshire, and his father was a small brewer. He was very unsuccessful at business, and so by the age of 11, Henry left school. He went to London to earn a living. By the time he was 16, he was making very uh, rapid spiritual progress in his faith. He was studying the scriptures. He was spreading the gospel. And then in 1885, he went to Australia, and in a short time, he made enough money to purchase his own business. In 1887, he returned to England and he married the woman of his dreams. So while in London, he became even more interested in spirituality, especially uh, spreading the gospel in the poorest districts of Notting Hill, in which newspapers had said was full of filth and violence and profanity, drunkenness and immorality. Mr. Varley was asked to teach Sunday school. There was a group that was naturally gathering there and Henry quickly went to work. He visited the homes of people. He dealt with them as to their state and started gospel meetings. And that congregation increased by leaps and bounds until it was standing room only all the way up to the door. In one of his later writings, Henry shared these words. The world has yet to see what God will do with, and for, and through, and in, and by a man who is fully consecrated to Christ. Years later, a shoe salesman in Chicago, who wasn't even educated past the fifth grade, read those words from Henry Varley. And that shoe salesman was so inspired, he went to start one of the greatest churches and Sunday schools in all of America. He was the Billy Graham of his day, traveled around the world, won thousands and thousands of people to Christ. And even to this day, the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago continues to train world-class leaders to impact the nations. It's all because D.L. Moody took seriously this challenge. The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by a man who is fully consecrated to Christ. As Moody thought about those words, he wrote in his own writings, Henry Varley said, a man. He didn't say a great man or a learned man or a smart man. He just simply said a man. I'm a man and it lies within me whether I will or will not make this full consecration to Christ. So I will do my best to be that man. What would happen if we took those words seriously? Do you think God could use us? Who, who me? Yes, you. Oh, but, I, but I'm too weak. You know, I'm, I've tried that kind of thing many times. I've, I've tried to follow Christ closely and, you know, I, I've failed. That, that can't be me. I mean, I don't, I don't have silver or gold, so, you know, I don't have what people want. The Bible is a big book. It has lots of stories, lots of characters, and I think we all have our favorites. And perhaps some of us have favorites because they inspire us or because they remind us of us. I love King David. I was named after him. I love Samson. He's just a big dummy. We learn a lot from him. I love Jonah because he reminds me of my own stubbornness and my own selfishness. I love Noah because he reminds me that I need to be patient with God. But of the 12 disciples, I love Peter. You might also. And I think it's because he's there to show us that you don't have to be perfect to be one of Jesus' favorites. One of the things I say is, Peter was a total screw up and I want to be just like him. Peter tried so hard to follow Christ and he failed time and time again, miserably. He went to sleep when he should have been praying. He promised that he'd follow Jesus all the way to the cross, but as soon as he thinks he might get in trouble, he denies even knowing Jesus. He was always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way. Peter wasn't a great man. <laughs> he wasn't a learned man. He wasn't a smart man. 
But God showed his power in Peter's life. And if he can do that with Peter, then he can do that with us. And I know most of us are not people that God uses in very big ways. He uses us in little ways. But what's it going to take? It's going to take men and women and teens and boys and girls to be the kind of people that God can use. Did you know that Texas is home to nine of the ten fastest growing cities in the nation? People from all over are moving here. The fastest growing city is Salina, Texas. On the far northern edge of the Dallas area, it increased by 143% in the last three years. As of last year, the population was up over 43,000. It was only 18,000 three years ago. And Montgomery is growing too. I mean, just look at 105, look at all the new homes and new businesses being built. Now, you may miss the small hometown feel, you may miss the big open fields and all the trees, and I miss those things too. But the good news is, growth means more people. And it means more Christians. Can God use us in big ways? Can God use Walden Church in big ways? Last week we read a story about Peter and John and they healed a crippled man who was crippled from birth over 40 years. And then afterward, they have the crowd's attention and they use that opportunity to preach the gospel. And today we're going to see the consequences for their actions. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of those men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been prepared, performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Peter and John are brought before religious court, and they are charged with teaching faith without a rabbi, without education, without authority. And their accusers say, show us your paperwork. Show us your documentation. And the Bible says that Peter and John were filled with the Holy Spirit. We started this off by uh, the story of the ascension at the beginning of the book of Acts. And in that, before Jesus goes to heaven, he gives them one last command. He says, don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes. So Peter and the others waited. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes in power. The Holy Spirit flows through their lives in big ways. And the Holy Spirit is still the power of the church. We 
must be filled with the Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit? How would you know? When you're filled with the Spirit, you are close to God. God is real to you. There is an explosion of God in your life. When you think of people you love and they don't know Christ, that makes you sad. When you are filled with the Spirit, you want to look like the fruit of the Spirit. You want a life of love and joy and peace and patience. You care about the things that God cares about. You see people the way that God sees. And when you do things for God and say things for God, something happens. God moves through you. Ephesians 3 says, To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. You know, the secret to being filled by God is to allow yourself to be emptied of the world. First, the sin and the selfishness has to leave. Listen, just like we saw earlier with our two examples of those great evangelists, sure, our our lives may not be anything like that, or, or maybe they will, who knows? But listen, whatever experience you've had in the past with God, there's more. You, you can go to a whole new level of intimacy with God and usefulness to God. Second Chronicles might be the most quoted and least practiced verse in the Bible. It says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Simply put, we need to seek him. To seek him. Why are Peter and John in this mess right now? Is it because they were minding their own business? No, they saw a beggar, walked around him. No, not my problem. No, they got involved because they were ministers. When the healing happened, where were they going? They were going to temple. Was this their once a week church service? No. For the devout Jew, there's three special times for prayer in the day. There's 9 a.m., there's 12 noon, and there's 3 p.m. Peter and John show up for worship, like they do every day, to seek God. Listen, do you think the world is getting better or worse? I agree with you, but what are we going to do about it? Church attendance is declining. What are we going to do about it? Well, what can one person do? One person can show up. One person can be filled with the Holy Spirit. One person can seek God daily. I mean, the days of thinking, six days of the week are mine, that's over. The days of thinking that 10 cents out of every dollar belongs to God, that's over. Ezra 8 says, The hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. As Montgomery grows, are we just going to cross our fingers and hope someone else is doing the work? I sure hope someone else is doing the work. I'd love to see God grow this church, but, you know, right now, All my prayers are for God to bless me. Second Chronicles says that God will heal our land. That's a promise. A promise from God. And all I I have to do is what? It says my people, people who are called by my name, meaning what? Us, church people, right? Christians. If Christians would just humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. We've got to seek his face. Psalm 63 says, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Hebrews 11.6 says, He rewards those who earnestly seek him. Seeking God 
is closeness to him, spending time with him, thanking and praising him, confessing sins, praying for others to come to know him and to have their needs met, asking to make us like Jesus, hearing his voice. Is, is there any way you could do better at seeking God? Because God can use me in big ways when I seek him. James 2 says a brother or sister in Christ might need clothes or food. If you say to that person, God be with you, I hope you stay warm and get plenty to eat, but you do not give what that person needs. Your words are worth nothing. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Listen, you can believe that you will lose weight all you want to. But if you sit on the couch and you watch TV and you eat potato chips, you're never going to lose any weight. That's what the Bible means when it says that faith without works is dead. You have to put feet to your faith, meaning you have to act on what you believe. If your goal is to lose weight, you may have to diet. You may have to exercise. Chances are you'll have to do both. If your goal is to make better grades, you can believe that you will make better grades, but if you never pick up a book and study, you're not gonna make better grades. You have to believe that you can, and you have to do something. John says something similar. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue but with actions and in truth. As believers in Christ, it is our responsibility to show our faith by our actions. How can a love that fills and changes your life not affect how you act? It is our actions that define our faith. Faith that is felt from a deep in your soul altering action your love of what Christ did for you should make you want to be more like him. The actions that our faith brings about will be an example of our belief. I'm not saying that our actions will justify us because they won't. I am saying that our love of Christ, our faith, should govern our actions. And those actions then inspire others. Oh, that's good we should inspire others, <laughs> right? We should inspire others. Acts 4 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Remember what we said about ordinary people? These religious leaders and educated teachers are baffled. Here are uneducated common men. And they speak so well, and they have authority, and they command a room, and they teach well. They present themselves well. What's their secret? A person with the Holy Spirit, a person who seeks God, is going to be a person who inspires others. This is where ministry comes in. This is why ministry is so important. Who do you inspire? Listen, we always need Sunday school teachers. We always need nursery workers. And the good news is we don't need volunteers who are extraordinary. We need people who want to be used by God and who will inspire those kids. Those kids need a Bible lesson more than you do. Do you know the Bible better than a sixth grader? <laughs> Can you help inspire them? Miss Teresa will give you the Bible lesson. All you have to do is follow it and read it. Those kids deserve to learn their Bible and draw close to God, just like you. They deserve to have a teacher who wants them to grow in faith and be inspired, just like you. When my son comes down from class, I want to be able to ask him, what did you learn about God? What did you learn about the Bible? How can we say we care about the future of the world or the state of things or the way things are going if we don't inspire others? I believe the world has yet to see 
what God will do with and for and through and in by any person who is fully devoted to Christ. I read that and think, I could be that person. We have to point people to Jesus. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) What do we see Peter and John doing in chapter 4? The same thing we saw them do in chapter 3. They were asked about their faith, they had an audience, and they used that opportunity to talk about Jesus. Verse 12. It's the verse we share every time we share the gospel. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How often am I doing that? How many opportunities have I missed to do that? We used to call this sharing your testimony. It doesn't have to be as scary or as memorized as we make it out to be. You know, sometimes your, your testimony could be a sentence. You know, just, just name drop Jesus whenever it's appropriate. You know, when my wife and I were struggling in our marriage, Jesus really gave us an anchor and, and a hope. Or, you know, I found talking to God really helps me process the hard times. Or, you know, I've tried all those things like drugs and sex and success and You know, I found that nothing really satisfies me like the love of Jesus. Peter's asked a question, and he made sure to mention Jesus. When asked about what he did, his actions, he doesn't take the credit. He made sure to connect what he did with Jesus. If we help someone, I don't need thanks. We want them to know that our love our generosity comes from Jesus. Maybe a phrase like, well, you know, I think that people are valuable and Jesus did that for me, so the least I can do is show some kindness to others. Another way you could share your testimony is just take a stand for your values. You know, stand up for the things that you believe in. When we have convictions about issues, without trying to be divisive, without trying to sound superior, we can show people that things like boundaries and beliefs are there to protect people. You know, could you lose friends because you have some convictions? Sometimes. But I think you'll also gain respect for standing up for your principles. Some people will appreciate the fact that you are honest and that you are standing behind what you believe. Look at this one. Matthew 10 says, when Jesus instructs his disciples, he says to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Wow. Can we do all that? Probably not, but we can pray. Right? We can pray. Another way you share share your testimony is through prayer. If you've never prayed for healing before, It requires faith and humility at the same time. Faith to believe God wants to heal someone, but humility to know that sometimes it doesn't always work. And that's okay. If someone is telling you about their own ailment or doctor's visits or even with their struggles, pray for them. Even if they're not a believer. Yes, even if they're not a believer. Just ask permission. Ask permission, pray for boldness. We need need less thoughts and prayers on Facebook and more people praying at Whataburger, at Walmart. And then invite them to an event. Invite them to church. You'd be surprised that people are more open to exploring faith and spirituality than you think. Or maybe their family would love to send their kids to VBS. Or or an invitation to come to church is what they really need so that they feel comfortable in a brand new environment. Or maybe they're not ready for some, you know, big church event, but they're still hungry for a community, maybe of men or women, maybe some fun event that speaks just to that. Taking the initiative and inviting people into our lives, that is a simple way to expand our relationships, but also to share our testimony. And then look at how the book of uh, 
Acts chapter 4 ends. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your Holy Spirit, Jesus, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You know, the easiest thing to do is nothing. Peter and John got some pushback, and they could have easily said, well, that didn't work. My friend doesn't want to come to church. My friend didn't want me to pray for them. That didn't work. I guess, you know, I'm not cut out for this. Listen, darkness wants you to quit. The world out there, they want you to shut up and go away. I saw a church on the news the other day. It was a church for atheists. They want what church has to offer, but they want God taken out. More and more, darkness wants you to do nothing. If I say the Church of America is in decline, and we say, well, what are you going to do? You know what I think? I think the world is yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by a man or woman who is fully devoted to Christ. What would happen if we took those words seriously? Do you think God could use you? Do you think God could use us, bless us? I do. Let's pray. Lord, we pray, we pray for all these things. We pray that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. We pray that we would seek your face. We pray that we would inspire others and lead them to Jesus. So, like that early church, we pray for boldness because that's what we really need. Our heart wants this. Our mind wants this. We do want it. I feel it. We want it. But we lack boldness. So shake our church. Shake this building. From the rafters down to the ground, shake this building. Shake my soul. Shake my spirit. Shake me up and wake me up in the time that I have left, in these remaining days. May I teach and inspire and share the love of Christ with boldness. Amen. Hey, just so you know, my name is Pastor David and I work here at Walden Community Church as their senior pastor. Um, I'm here throughout the week. I'm here till 3 p.m., 3.30. And uh, if you need to, you can stop by anytime. You don't need an appointment. I'm here to talk to you. I'm here to help you be the church where you live. We have youth group. So if you have a sixth grader through 12th grader, uh, we have youth group on Wednesday nights. It starts at six o'clock. They play games, they play pool, they play air hockey. They got foosball. And we're even gonna feed them dinner. 
So send your kids over on their bikes. We have a, a youth leader named uh, Mike who would love to meet them. He'd love to meet you. We also have youth group at uh, 11 o'clock on Sundays. So you can send your kids to church or come with them, you know, come with them. At 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with a worship band. You don't have to dress up. Just come casual. It's Walden. You can, you can come casual. And we have something for all ages uh, in your family. We would love to help you, to be a resource for you, and to disciple you and nurture you in your walk and in your family's walk in Christ. Call me, send me an email, whatever you need, I'm here. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.